We have many viewers out there in Zoom land, and we have many people in the room here. This is our Wednesday night lecture, and through the Yoga Studies program at Loyola Marymount University, we welcome remarkable people to share a little bit of their research and a little bit of their wisdom. And we're very, very happy this evening to have Swami Medananda. And Swami Medananda holds many roles within the world, including a scholar in residence at the Vedanta Center in Hollywood, California. He's also the Hindu chaplain for both UCLA and the University of Southern California. And tonight he's our chaplain. Uh, he holds a PhD in philosophy from University of California, Berkeley. He's published more than 30 scholarly articles, and he's also written and edited various books. And tonight his topic will be on karma and how do we figure all of this out. So let us welcome Swami. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Professor Chapel and to Zoe for organizing this. And thank you all for coming, both here and online. Um, let's, I have a PowerPoint. Okay, so the best way to change slides would be, right, okay. <clears throat> all right. So good evening, and um, I apologize in advance. It's a, it's going to be. I hope it's not too dry philosophy, but it will be very philosophical. So just a heads up. Um, yeah, the topic is an integral Advaitic theodicy of spiritual evolution, karma, rebirth, and universal liberation. Um, what is theodicy? Theodicy is an attempt to explain why God permits all the evil and suffering that we see in the world. Very roughly. Um, why is that a problem? Well, on the traditional understanding of the theistic God, God is omnipotent, which means that God is capable of achieving anything that's logically possible, including preventing us from suffering. And God is also posited as perfectly loving, perfectly good. And if that's the case, so if God is both omnipotent and perfectly loving, then God would want to prevent us from suffering. And yet, the fact is, we see suffering all around us. A new war has just started. So the question is, how do we reconcile God's goodness and omnipotence on the one hand with the fact of all the suffering and evil we see in the world? Theodicy is an attempt to explain why God permits all this evil and suffering that we see in the world. That's the idea. And there are many, many, many different kinds of theodicy in different global religious traditions, spiritual traditions. And I'm going to talk about a particular one namely the theodicy championed by three modern Vedantic mystics, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, and Sri Aurobindo. Um, this is the, what I'm presenting today is part of a much larger project. In fact, um, it's part of a trilogy of books, and I call it my Integral Advaita Trilogy, because I'm arguing that these three figures have actually developed a new school of integral Advaita within Vedantic thought. And I've already published two of the three books in the trilogy. So the book on Sri Ramakrishna is called Infinite Paths to Infinite Realities, published by Oxford in 2018. And the book on Swami Vivekananda, published last year by Oxford. And I'm about to sign a contract for the third book on Sri Aurobindo, again with Oxford. Um, but I'm not going to start writing that until I complete the book I'm working on now, which is called Karma and Rebirth in Hinduism very much relevant to the stuff I'll be presenting on today. That'll be coming out with Cambridge University Press. Um, <clears throat> so what do I, very roughly, what do I mean by integral Advaita? That's a huge topic, but just to give you a, a general sense, just as a kind of uh, counterpoint, um, many of you probably are familiar with Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, the great eighth century uh, Indian philosopher. Um, on um, one mainstream understanding of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, I say that carefully because some people disagree with this interpretation. But on one mainstream understanding of Shankara's philosophy, the only reality is non-dual pure consciousness, Nirguna Brahman. 
and everything else is an illusory appearance. It only appears to be real, but in fact is non-existent. That includes this entire world of names and forms. That includes each of us as individual souls. In fact, we're, it's not even true that we're separate individual souls. There's only non-dual pure consciousness. And even the personal God turns out to be an illusory appearance from, from Shankara's standpoint. By contrast, the integral Advaita philosophy of these thinkers Charam, and mystics of Sharam Krishna, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, holds that the ultimate reality, the divine reality, is in one aspect, the impersonal non-dual pure consciousness of Shankara, but in another aspect is equally Shakti, the personal God. We're gonna be celebrating Kali Puja next Sunday. And um, we just had Durga Puja a couple of weeks ago. So Shakti means the personal God, and Sri Ramakrishna used to teach Brahman and Shakti are inseparable, which means that non-dual pure consciousness and Shakti, the personal God, are the static and dynamic aspects, respectively, of one and the same infinite divine reality. So that's one of the key premises of integral Advaita. And secondly, what is the status of this world? The ontological status of this world? According to Shankara, it's an illusory appearance, ultimately non-existent. Yeah. Um, but from the standpoint of integral Advaita, the world is a real manifestation of Shakti. Okay, so these are the two uh, def differences I'll just mention right now. Um, are we good? No. Okay, we're gonna find out. All right. So now let's look at the theodicy of these integral Advaitic philosopher mystics. We can begin with this passage from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. A neighbor asks Sri Ramakrishna, why has God created wick wicked people? And Sri Ramakrishna answers, that is her will, her play. By her, he means Divine Mother. There is no doubt that anger, lust, and greed are evils. Why then has God created them? In order to create saints. Mohot lok toyir korvin boli. He spoke originally in Bengali. One becomes a saint by conquering the senses. Is there anything impossible for one who has subdued his passions? He can even realize God through her grace. So this, the sentence I highlighted in order to create saints, I think is really important. I hope um, it's clear that this is kind of the overarching theme of their theodicy. The idea is that God permits evil and suffering in this world in order to facilitate our ethical and spiritual progress for us to grow morally and spiritually and ultimately to become saints. Um, and this theodicy of what I call spiritual evolution uh, has three main components. One is the doctrine of karma. The second is the doctrine of rebirth. And the third is the doctrine of universal liberation. And so I'll talk about each of those in turn. So first of all, the doctrines of karma and rebirth. Swami Vivekananda, the chief disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, he responded to the problem of evil and suffering by appealing to these doctrines of karma and rebirth. So this is the passage. Then the question comes, if God is the ruler of this universe, why did he create such a wicked universe? Why must we suffer so much? It is not God's fault. It is our fault that we suffer. Whatever we sow, we reap. He did not do anything to punish us. Man is born poor or blind or some other way. What is the reason? He had done something before. He was born that way. The jiva, the individual soul, has been existing for all time, was never created. It has been doing all sorts of things all the time. Whatever we do reacts upon us. If we do good, we shall have happiness. And if evil, unhappiness. So one of the key points he's making here is that God is off the hook in terms of the evil and suffering we see in the world. Why? Because of the doctrine of karma, which entails that we reap what we sow. So whatever suffering we undergo is a result of what we ourselves did, either earlier in this life or in a past life. So according to the law of karma, we'll eventually experience the consequences of all of our thoughts and deeds, whether good or evil, either in this life or in a future life. Um, and the law of karma is intimately linked to the doctrine of rebirth. Even if we don't reap the karmic consequences of our deeds in this life, we will definitely do so in a subsequent lifetime. So the two doctrines go hand in hand. One entails the other. And what are the theodical implications of these doctrines of karma and rebirth? I think there are two major ones. The first, the law of karma shifts moral responsibility away from God into God's creatures. 
we ourselves are responsible for bringing evil into the world through our own unwholesome thoughts and actions. But secondly, and this is what makes the doctrine so powerful. Um, Max Weber says said it was it's the only successful theodicy, and Arthur Herman has an entire book called The Problem of Evil in Indian Thought, where he kind of surveys most of the major theodicies in the Christian tradition, finds them all falling short, and then says that the only successful theodicy is karma. But I think part of the explanatory power of the karma and rebirth, uh, uh, theodicies grounded in karma and rebirth is the second point. The doctrines of karma and rebirth jointly explain in principle all instances of evil and suffering in the world. Um, it's an all comprehensive kind of doctrine. The wicked don't ultimately prosper, even if we think they do. They will get what's coming to them, if not in this life, then in a future life. Um, and the other thing is, in, in the Western context, Western philosophy, religion, Western theology, there's this issue of gratuitous suffering. There's, there's a distinction between ordinary suffering and then there's gratuitous, which implies that it's suffering that God could or should have prevented, that was unnecessary. And according to the law of karma, there is no strictly gratuitous suffering. If there's suffering, it serves a soul-making purpose. And it's partly paying off our karmic debts. So it's a combination of the two. Another thing, and I think this is really important to understanding what's distinctive about the integral Advaitic theodicy of Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and Aurobindo, as opposed to especially traditional Vedantins and their understanding of karma, um, I would distinguish between retributive and evolutionary conceptions of karma. So according to the retributive karma doctrine, which is, I think, the mainstream view, and many people, when I think of karma, they think about the retributive doctrine, even among most Hindus, I would say. The law, of, the law of karma is primarily a system of rewards and punishments. That's a phrase used by Sri Aurobindo. Designed to give us what we deserve. And so the key is karma as retribution. It's a principle of retribution. We did something bad, therefore we get a slap on the wrist or something worse, depending on the severity of the thing that we did that was bad. But by contrast, there's what's called the evolutionary karma doctrine according to which the law of karma ensures that we reap what we sow. So it's not actually kind of diametrically opposed to the retributive theory. They both accept that we reap what we sow. But according to the evolutionary understanding of karma, the whole purpose of the doctrine of karma, this whole, the whole law, the machinery of karma and rebirth, is to foster our own moral and spiritual growth. Um, Sri Aurobindo puts it well. He says, the true foundation of the theory of rebirth is the evolution of the soul. And Vivekananda says, using a metaphor, that this world is a great gymnasium in which you and I and millions of souls must come and get exercises and make ourselves strong and perfect. Okay. Um, some of you might be familiar with John Hicks' Soul Making Theodicy. So this, I see this as a, a Hindu version of a soul making theodicy. I call it a saint making theodicy, um, but with certain advantages, I think, over Hicks' theory as well especially the doctrines of karma and rebirth, which Hick sort of, for the end of his life, he kind of warms to them, but never fully embraces them. Yeah, he was the only Presbyterian that was mm. Right, yeah, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> for being too heretical in his, yeah. Um, okay, and here is Aurobindo's uh, account of evolutionary karma. So he rejects the doctrine of retributive karma, and he says the following, nor can good fortune and evil fortune, pleasure and pain, happiness and misery and suffering be taken as if they existed merely as incentives and deterrents to the natural being in its choice of good and evil. It is for experience, for growth of the individual being that the soul enters into rebirth, joy and grief, pain and suffering, Fortune and misfortune are parts of that experience, means of that growth. And this is interesting. He says, even the soul may of itself accept or choose poverty, misfortune, and suffering as helpful to its growth, stimulants of a rapid development, and reject riches and prosperity and success as dangerous and conducive to a relaxation of its spiritual effort. All the secret of the circumstances of rebirth centers around the one capital need of the soul the need of growth, the need of experience. That governs the line of its evolution and all the rest 
is accessory. So he's giving a really interesting example of how a soul might actually choose to be in what seem to be unhappy or unfavorable circumstances, like being born into a very poor family, for instance. But he, that soul will do so if it thinks that it's going to foster its moral and spiritual growth. That's the idea. And it's not always helpful to be born into a rich family and to enjoy all good things. Often we learn most through suffering. Swami Vivekananda used to say, suffering is the great eye-opener. The third doctrine, which is integral to this theodicy, is the doctrine of universal liberation. Um, this doctrine goes hand in hand with the evolutionary conception of karma and rebirth. Universal liberation is simple. It's the view that every single soul will ultimately attain liberation, if not in this life, then in a future life. Liberation from what? Liberation from the cycle of rebirth and all its attendant suffering. Now, here we come up to another um, distinctive aspect of integral Advaita philosophy. Liberation, according to Ramakrishna, takes different forms for different liberated souls. So there isn't just like one heaven or whatever state or place of liberation that everybody will ultimately reach. It's all, they're all equally liberation, states of liberation, but they're two fundamentally different paradigms. Ramakrishna used to say, using a metaphor, there's the paradigm of eating sugar and there's a paradigm of becoming sugar. So the becoming sugar paradigm are, is, the, is a salvation like uh, the Buddhist Nirvana or Advaita Vedanta, where like Advaita Vedanta, for instance, want to merge their individuality in non-dual pure consciousness. Even merging is not quite right, but just realize their true nature as non-dual pure consciousness. And that's it. There's no going or coming. There are no heavens, nothing like that, according to Advaita Vedanta. And in Buddhism, in most forms, and Theravada especially, it's all about nirvana, right? On the other hand, there's the eating sugar paradigm of salvation, of liberation. This is the paradigm of dwelling in an eternal heaven with your chosen ideal, with some form of the personal God. So Christians can dwell in their Christian heaven. Muslims in Jannah, the Muslim heaven, um, Vaishnavas in Goloka, and so on and so forth. And so I like to, this is my own kind of take on this, but I like to think of Sri Ramakrishna's understanding of the state of liberation as a many-roomed mansion, and different liberated souls can choose to inhabit that room in the mansion that they want to inhabit, depending on what their spiritual practices were, what their preferences and temperament is. They can stay in the Christian room if they want, or the Muslim room, or the Vaishnava room or the Shakta room and so on and so forth. Um, but they're all states of liberation and it's not a hierarchy. There are some philosophies like Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which accepts multiple states of not, well, not quite salvation, but multiple states of um, eschatological states, but there's a hierarchy. There's higher and lower in Goloka, where you dwell with Krishna as the highest. So I don't see Ramakrishna as endorsing any kind of hierarchy across the different states of liberation. So what's the, what are the theodical implications of universal salvation? I think they're fairly obvious, but the various finite evils of this life and of all of our lifetimes, basically, are outweighed by the infinite good of liberation that awaits us all. So no matter how terrible the suffering we're undergoing, it's necessarily finite. And the good of salvation is, by definition, infinite. It's eternal. And so that necessarily outweighs the, the suffering that we face in this life and in other lifetimes. Um, okay, this is somewhat technical, but um, I wanted to mention that a number of philosophers, including Peter Van Inwagen and Eleanor Stump, they distinguish two different responses to the problem of evil. One is called theodicy, the other is defense. So a theodicy aims to establish that a particular explanation of why God permits suffering is plausible or more probable than not. Okay, the language here is very important, so that's what I'm just going to read straight. By contrast, a defense aims to establish the more modest conclusion that a particular explanation of why God permits suffering is true for all we know, in the sense that we have no good reason to believe the explanation is false. So do you see the subtle difference here between defense and theodicy? Defense is um, a weaker claim. The claim is just that, for all we know, the the this, this explanation could be true. But there's no reason to think that it's more likely true than not. Whereas a theodicy 
is is going to make a stronger claim, claiming that it's probable that my explanation is true. And the vast majority of philosophers responding to the problem of suffering have contented themselves with providing a defense rather than a theodicy, because they think that doing giving a theodicy is just too ambitious from a philosophical standpoint. But I want to claim that this, what I'm presenting to you today, is actually a robust theodicy and not just a defense. Um, and that they, these thinkers give good reasons, or at least um, certain reasons for believing in the plausibility of some of the key components of the theodicy, karma, rebirth, and universal liberation. So let's begin to see how that works. So first, how do we make a case for the plausibility of universal salvation or universal liberation? Here again, Hick is useful. Hick, in his book, Evil and the God of Love, defends the plausibility of the doctrine of universal salvation by arguing that the doctrine of eternal damnation and eternal hell is fatal to theodicy. How does he do so? In two key steps. He says, if God is omnipotent, then God is able to prevent anyone from being condemned to an eternal hell. That's just, that's what omnipotence means. He could easily prevent anyone from being condemned to eternal hell. And if God is perfectly loving, then God would want to prevent anyone from being condemned to an eternal hell. So therefore, on the assumption of a theistic God who is both omnipotent and perfectly loving, every soul must eventually attain salvation. And he thinks this is a serious, fatal problem for Orthodox Abrahamic religions, which do accept an eternal hell for some souls. Um, and so I think we can, integral Advaitans can help themselves to this kind of argument for the plausibility of universal salvation on our side. Now, what about the plausibility of the doctrines of karma and rebirth? I think there, there are many arguments, but here are three that I think are some of the most interesting and uh, arguably powerful. The first is the moral case. On the assumption of a theistic God, the doctrines of karma and rebirth are better able than a single life paradigm to explain the initial disparate condition of children and in various instances of suffering. So, Vivekananda makes this argument and many other Hindu thinkers, but Carlo Felice, more recently, in a 2006 article in Religious Studies, as, uh, the article is called The Moral Case for Reincarnation. He makes a similar case, and, and I think quite persuasively. Um, the idea is that if, if you're actually born with certain terrible kinds of suffering, Hick gives an example of a two-year-old with cerebral meningitis, um, which turns out to be fatal. It's impossible to explain from a single life paradigm, what that soul could have done to have deserved that. But if you accept karma and rebirth, then you can explain it based on what the what the baby's soul did in a previous life. Right? Um, second major argument in favor of the doctrines of karma and rebirth, empirical evidence. There's a growing number of cases of children um, reporting specific details about their past lives that are later verified. So Ian Stevenson is a pioneer in this regard. And one of his, we can call him a disciple, I guess, Jim Tucker at University of Virginia, he has pursued the work even further. And I think one of the um, things that Tucker has done that Ian didn't do um, is that Stevenson focused on cases in South Asia where there's widespread belief in rebirth and karma. And so he opened himself to criticism from critics like Paul Edwards that lo and behold, when you're investigating cases of government rebirth in countries where they believe in rebirth, you find some. Um, Jim Tucker has focused on American cases, which is really interesting. He's published, I recommend, uh, um, it's, a, it's one book published as before, but which is a combination of two of his books, Children's Memory of Memories of Previous Lives. And there are some really, they're really fascinating cases. There's a case of, uh, there was a two-year-old. He's now, I think, a teenager or something. His name is James Leininger. And he would wake up with nightmares, shouting, mayday, mayday, my plane's on fire. And his parents tried to ignore it for the first few days, but it was this recurring nightmare, and it kept coming up. Mayday, mayday, plane's on fire, plane's on fire, man going down, and this and the, that. And then they do, then they ask him more questions about it, and he gives all this information. The name of his aircraft carrier, USS Natoma Bay, he claimed he was a World War II fighter pilot in Japan, and that his plane was shot at that time. And the parents went into the history books and verified a huge number of these facts. It's quite interesting. Um, that's just one of many cases that Jim Tucker has investigated. So there's a kind of growing body of empirical evidence as well. 
Um, the third kind of argument in favor of dharma and rebirth is um, what I would call mystical testimony. Numerous mystics claim to have knowledge of their own past lives. Um, and I want to go into a little bit more detail on this third point, mystical testimony. So Swami Vivekananda explains the method for gaining knowledge of our past lives. It's based on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, which many of you are experts in. So, um, Samskara Sakshatkar Anat Purva Jati Gyanam is the sutra I'm thinking of. Which sutra is that? Anyone? I can't remember. But anyway, come on, guys. Can't can't you sing it for us? <laughs> it, it, it's 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 Samskara Sakshatkar Anat Purva Jati. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's doesn't matter, but it's there. Okay. <laughs> So the idea is in the sutra, since our unconscious contains the latent impressions, the samskaras of the things we did and thought, not only in this life, but also in our past lives, we can gain knowledge of our past lives by concentrating intensely on those samskaras as prescribed in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. That's the basic idea. We have all of our past life memories stored up in our minds, but they're latent. We're not conscious of them, but we can become conscious of them through a special kind of yogic meditation. Um, and Vivekananda goes further and claims that each one of us will get back this memory of past lives in that life in which he will become free. So in our last birth, that's part of what it means to, to attain liberation is that you gain knowledge of your past lives. And I think part of the implication is that we're not ready for knowledge of our past lives before that, the vast majority of us, which is why God in his wisdom suppresses that knowledge so that we can, so that just imagine how I mean, we're already burdened with what we did in this life. So imagine if we had a million lives of <laughs> all sorts of things that we did to, you know, would be emotional wrecks. Um, and Hick, John Hick, he raises the possibility that either from time to time, perhaps in the intervals between earthly lives or at the end of the karmic process, the unity of the whole series of lives is seen in retrospect. So he's saying that it's possible that even though most of us don't have memories of our past lives in this current state, it might be that after we leave this physical body and before we take on the next physical body, we might gain a kind of lucidity um, resulting in knowledge of our past lives. Or that it, we gain knowledge of past lives in our last birth, like Vivekananda says. But in either case, that's enough. Um, that's it, Just because we don't have no memories of our past lives now doesn't mean that we won't in the future. And this, again, building on this third point, mystical testimony, the big question here is why should... Many people will say, so what? If some people claim to have knowledge of past lives, they, people can claim anything. Why should we believe them? That's, that's a really important question. In philosophical terms, the question is, do putatively mystical experiences have epistemic value? Which means, do mystical experiences or putatively, I mean, alleged mystical experiences, do, are, do they count as sources of knowledge? And if so, why? Why should we take them to be sources of knowledge? Um, and Vivekananda presents an argument in support of the epistemic value of mystical experience. I discuss this in great detail in chapters five and six of my book on Vivekananda. So if you want details, please look at that. But I'm giving you a very, very brief summary. So he asks, what is the proof of God? Direct perception, pratyaksha. The proof of this wall is that I perceive it. God has been perceived that way by thousands before and will be perceived by all who want to perceive him. But this perception is no sense perception at all. It is super sensuous, super conscious. So I think he's making some very subtle philosophical moves here, even though it might seem kind of obvious, but I think it requires quite a bit of unpacking. I think the idea is this. We ordinarily take our sense perceptions to be proof that what we perceive actually exists. I perceive a wall. Therefore, I think I'm justified in believing that the wall exists. We do this all the time. We couldn't get out of bed if we didn't do it. We couldn't come to work. We couldn't come to campus, couldn't study. We couldn't do anything unless we accepted this principle implicitly. So this everyday behavior is justified on the basis of a general epistemic principle, which Vivekananda formulates as follows. Whatever we see and feel is proof if there has been nothing to delude the senses. So if we perceive something, that's prima facie justification for believing that that something, that X exists. If I perceive X, it's reasonable for me to believe that X exists. Let's call this the principle of perceptual proof, PP for short. 
But Vivekananda goes further and defends a second epistemic principle, the testimony, according to which, the testimony of an opta, a critical, credible person. This is a term used constantly in yoga philosophy as well. The testimony of a credible person, an opta, about her perception of some entity constitutes proof for others that that entity exists. We can call this the principle of testimonial proof, TP. Okay, so we had PP in the previous slide, now we have TP. Vivekananda argues that both PP and TP are uncontroversial principles of rationality that are indispensable in everyday life. We can't do without them. We also can't do without testimonial proof. How much of our knowledge actually comes from testimony? If you, reading newspapers, watching television. When I'm about to step outside, maybe my father says, hey, it's raining, you should use an umbrella. That's testimony. And I don't normally doubt him unless I know that it's April Fool's Day and he's, you know, he's trying to pull a fast one on me. <laughs> okay. So if we accept PP and TP, these two epistemic principles, then the testimony of a credible yogi who claims to have perceived a supersensuous reality, such as God or an immortal soul, constitutes proof for others that that supersensuous reality exists. Um, so if we accept the epistemic value of mystical experiences, then the evidential case for rebirth and for the existence of a theistic God is significantly strengthened. Um, because there are many people throughout the world who claim to have direct mystical knowledge of some of their past lives. And there are other mystics, and sometimes the same mystic, who claims to have direct knowledge of God, right? some experience, direct experience of the ultimate reality. Okay, I wanted to address um, two objections to the doctrine of rebirth. I wanna discuss this first one in, in some detail and then discuss a second one briefly. So the first objection is called the lack of memory objection to rebirth. The second objection, which I'll just discuss only briefly is called the quietism objection. So first, the lack of memory objection to the doctrine of rebirth goes as follows. If rebirth was true, we should have at least some memories of one or more of our past lives. But since we don't remember anything from our past lives, the doctrine of rebirth must be false. Um, Paul Edwards has written an entire book called Reincarnation, A Critical Examination, where he attacks the doctrines of rebirth and karma um, with various arguments. This is one of them. And I think there are four lines of response to this objection that um, proponents of rebirth have given. The first response, memory, according to people like Vivekananda, Dukas, and others, memory is not a reliable indicator of personal continuity, since we typically have no memories of the first six months after our birth. Probably none of us in this room actually remember what we were doing in the first six months of our birth. I'd be surprised if somebody one or two of you did. Um, but does that mean that we weren't that six-month-old baby? No, right? So that's the argument. Just because we don't have a memory of something doesn't mean that we weren't the same person. Edwards is not satisfied and he is aware of this objection. He responds as follows. He, he responds by arguing that even if we have no memories from the first six months after our birth, we're the same person as we were then because we have the same body, the same physical body. That six month old baby's body and my body are the same. He argues that rebirth, by contrast, means that we inhabited a different body in a previous life. So the absence of any memories from our previous life constitutes evidence that rebirth is false. Okay, So he thinks that the continuity of the physical body is enough to secure personal identity, even in the absence of memory. But and I think that uh, proponents of rebirth uh, can rebut this objection by arguing as follows. Edwards' claim that bodily continuity is sufficient to secure a personal identity, even in the absence of memory, amounts to nothing more than a dogmatic assertion, because he doesn't actually defend what philosophers call the bodily criterion of personal identity. And it's a very, very controversial theory, actually, of personal identity, if you look at the literature on the topic. Um, there's a vast philosophical literature on the question of personal identity, and the bodily criterion view advocated by Edwards, the view that personal identity is secured by bodily identity, is a highly controversial minority position in contemporary metaphysics. Um, Eric Olson has an article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on personal identity that discusses this. Philosophers such as Peter Unger have argued that the bodily criterion is implausible in light of the brain transplant thought experiment, which goes as follows. If a person X's brain is transplanted into another human body, then our intuition is that X remains the same person even though X's brain is now in a different 
body. So it's a kind of intuitional thought experiment. And this intuition suggests that the bodily criterion of personal identity is false. As a result of this and other thought experiments and reasons, the majority of contemporary philosophers working on personal identity advocate some form of what they call the psychological continuity theory of personal identity, which is compatible with the possibility of rebirth. What, what is the psychological continuity theory? It just means if you have the same mind, that's enough to secure personal identity. You don't need to have the same physical body. Um, Olson, Eric Olson, the author of that SCP article, he adds another objection to the bodily criterion defended by Edwards. He says, the bodily criterion will tell us nothing about our identity through time unless we have at least some idea of what it takes for a person's body to persist. Yet no one has ever produced a serious account of the identity conditions of human bodies. So the basic gist is, what in the world is the same in that six month old baby's body with, with the current body I have now? Almost all the cells in the body are different. I look completely different, right? So it, the burden is on Edwards who's defending this bodily criterion of personal identity to explain exactly in what sense a body can continue. The same bo six month old body is the same 43 year old body now in my case. All right. But there are three other lines of response to the same lack of memory objection. So the second response would be that this is something I just I actually mentioned a few minutes ago, but God has wisely withheld from most of us conscious memory of our previous lives, since having those memories would have added to our psychological and emotional baggage, making it much more difficult, if not impossible, to focus on the challenges and opportunities of this life, because we'd be so overburdened by what we did in previous lives that we wouldn't be able to move forward. In response, Whitley Kaufman, um, he's written some, he had an interesting debate in philosophy East and West a few years ago with Moni Machada, Nick Trakakis, and Arvind Sharma on Dharma and Rebirth. And the whole debate's very, I think, illuminating and insightful. So he argues uh, in response that, quote, it is hardly plausible to say it is better never or even rarely to remember past deeds or lives since acknowledging past mistakes is in general an important, even essential educating force in our lives. So his argument is that it's actually very helpful in most cases to have a memory of what we did in the past in order to learn from it. How do we learn from our mistakes unless we know what mistakes we actually made in the past? That's the logic. But here's how I think the proponent of rebirth would respond to him. So I'm pursuing this kind of dialectical chain. So, the proponent of rebirth could argue as follows, while acknowledging and trying to learn from our past mistakes in this life is no doubt an educating force, the question at issue is whether having knowledge of all of our past mistakes in our previous lives would also be beneficial for us. And I think it's not obvious that the answer is yes. And many Hindu thinkers and proponents of rebirth will say that would be, just be too overwhelming a psychological burden for us to, to bear. Third line of response to this lack of memory objection, um, as a number of philosophers like Roy Perrett and Carlo Felice have noted, even if most of us don't have conscious memories of our past lives, the presence of latent memories of our past lives is arguably sufficient to secure personal identity. Um, so what do I mean by latent memories? I already mentioned it briefly, but I'll say it again. Vivekananda and others have claimed that memories of past lives are latent in each of us in the form of samskaras, latent mental impressions. And it's possible to gain knowledge of these past life samskaras, thereby bringing conscious memories of our past lives to consciousness through certain meditative practices. And Edwards and other critics fail to consider the possibility that latent memories of past lives are sufficient to secure personal identity. So the, the, the argument would be that conscious memories are not necessary for personal identity, as long as the memories are at least latent in us, which we can awaken at a different point in time through particular means. And the fourth response, the fourth line of response to this lack of memory objection is, even if most people don't have memory, any memories of their previous lives, there's now abundant evidence that numerous people across the world, including ordinary people and mystics, so many children who are non-mystics, like James Leininger, claim to have memories of one or more of their past lives. And in certain cases, these memories have been verified. Um, and while Edwards found, quote, big holes in the cases documented by Ian Stevenson for various reasons, one is, as I said, because he's only doing re investigating cases in South Asian countries that already believe in karma and rebirth. But other holes are like the translator, because Ian, Ian didn't know 
the Asian language in, in question. So he, he would have to communicate with the families via a translator. And he was he's questioning the uh, neutrality of the translator and whether the translator is actually trying to prove that rebirth is true as well. And there are all these things. That, but the point is, the more recent work of Jim Tucker, who's very much alive and still kicking and doing his work on rebirth, um, doesn't suffer from at least those flaws um, because he's doing cases, he's exploring cases in the US where obviously he doesn't need a translator. And finally, this is, uh, there are many more objections. I'm writing a chapter now on, on all the various objections to rebirth and they're like, I'm discussing at least nine, but I'm talking about two here. This is the second one. And this, I'll talk about this very briefly and then we'll conclude. This is what's called the quietism objection to the doctrine of karma. If all of us get what we deserve, then why should we try to help alleviate the suffering of others? It's quite an interesting objection, actually. If, if this person that I see who's suffering, if I believe in the doctrine of karma and rebirth, then that person deserves his or her suffering. So then why should I help that person? This is the objection, right? Wouldn't we be interfering with and even hindering the workings of karma by mitigating the suffering of others, right? If we help that person, then we're interfering with that, with that person's karma. And we should instead let that person suffer and, and exhaust his or her karma. But there are two basic lines of response to this. The first is, it's the result of suffering person X's own good karma that person Y comes along to help alleviate X's suffering. So the fact that I'm here and able to help that person means that that person earned that, <laughs> the, your presence to help that person, right? Secondly, and these two things, these two points go hand in hand. We, we, as bystanders who could potentially help somebody in suffering, we accrue good karma and grow morally and spiritually by helping others and trying to alleviate their suffering. So we also accrue good karma by helping people who are in need and suffering. So I think that these are the two basic, I think probably the most promising lines of response to the quietism. Okay, as I said, there's a lot more I could say, many more objections, um, but I'd like to hear from you as well. So for, uh, I'll just uh, conclude by mentioning that for a more in-depth discussion and defense of the Hindu theodicy sketched here, you can look at um, several of my articles, um, chapter seven and eight of my book on Ramakrishna. And if you want more details on this very, very thorny philosophical question of defending the epistemic value of mystical experience, you can look at chapters five and six of my book on Vivekananda. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you with the Namaskar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Mm. Mm, yeah. Right, that's a good question. Now it's like we, we have there's a, a kind of glut of people claiming to have knowledge of past lives. And how do you separate the plausible cases from those that are not? Um, uh, that gets tricky, but partly it's about based on, can you verify their claims? Because a lot of this is unverifiable, which doesn't mean that it's not true. But I think that the most interesting cases are those uh, that can be verified to a certain extent. Like I'm thinking of a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. Are any of you familiar with Brian Weiss? Um, he was very skeptical, psychotherapist. He didn't believe in rebirth. He didn't believe in God. Oh, is that the one that we were all doing? You mean you're doing it yourself or with, under the guidance of? Oh, I see. Okay. And then everybody felt like they had knowledge of their past life? That's interesting. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, well. That's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, no, so that's that's great. I mean, yeah, if, if um yeah, I mean there, there's there's one thing is how it may benefit you personally, and the other is whether you can, that's gonna convince other people. And if it helped you, then it doesn't really matter whether other people believe it or not. I think that's that that's that's perfectly fine as a position. But I think the strongest cases to persuade others are those that can actually be empirically verified in certain ways. And so the Brian Weiss story is interesting because while he was putting this lady under, 
she would sometimes change her tone of voice and become a master. Like she wouldn't speak like a young woman, but like some kind of oracular male voice telling Brian things about his life that she could not possibly have known, which he then verified. And so this is a very interesting indirect way of verifying. So it's not that he verified that she had all those past lives, but certain things that she said while under hypnosis actually turned out to be true, which lends greater credence to the other assertions she makes about the past lives. Yeah, thank you so much. So can you repeat everyone's questions? So oh, so right. Okay. Cause there are no mics for you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah. The first question was about um, the fact that many people these days are engaging in past life regressions and claiming to have knowledge of past lives. And I think that's a great thing. Um, and um, especially if it's helpful to the person, then um, then there's no reason why you should doubt it. But to persuade others, it's more useful to have um, cases that can be empirically verified. Uh, and this question, sorry, now remind me again, but I just forgot. Uh, well, you oh yeah, protection and Agama, yeah, Anumana. right. What about Anumana? Yeah, okay, so let me just, yeah. So these three Sanskrit terms, one is Pratyaksha, which means direct perception. Agama is scripture or you know, testimony. Um, and you're asking about anumana, inference, the role of inference. Um, well, th the thing is, pratyaksha and anumana are kind of linked in many cases. And so, for instance, when I perceive something, I often, I can infer things on the basis of my perceptions. Um, but in the case of the particular argument that I'm running here for the, uh, for the epistemic value of mystical experiences, I think the key are pratyaksha and anumana. But the argument itself depends on anumana. I mean, did I say, what did I say? The argument depends on pratyaksha and agama, but the argument itself has multiple premises leading to a conclusion, which is itself an example of anumana. <laughs> so that would be, so anumana is also involved in the argument, but not as a premise, but it's it's the whole reasoning involved in the argument. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've delved into both the Buddhist castle claims and instances from the Yoga Vasishta mm. In Jain literature, it seems that what Brian Weiss is talking about mm. are psychological moments that are sort of cause and relation. Why do I do this? Because of that. Mm -hmm. But in the classical literature, mm. there's more of a sense of all of beauty, appreciation, mm. and uh, moral takeaway. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could mm. um, comment a bit on mm. the function of the narratives of past lives in mm. the traditional Sanskrit Pali literature. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And you're thinking of Buddhism and Jainism in particular? Or, or, or and what? Was, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And what can you give an example? What do you mean by on beauty? I mean, uh, well, example? for instance, the story of Mm. In which many of these folks occur, mm. the psychological difficulty arises at the death of parents. Mm. And the reason for the recollection of past lives is to overcome grief mm. by seeing one life as sort of an evidence and bubble right. moment of change. Mm. But in order to get to that place of acceptance, the older brother, Punya, mm. tells his distraught younger brother, Pada, to just calm down, look at those beautiful deer over there, mm. and look at that majestic lion on that mountain ridge, mm. and consider these trees and these mm. insects. You have been all of those beings. Mm. And it's a combination I of. See. Um, you know, come to your senses, mm. but the emphasis is more on letting the present reality be a reminder of what was in right. okay. interconnection. Mm. And you don't see that in Brian Weiss, is that what you're saying? I'm just saying that, yeah, yeah it's a little bit more like a nervous yeah. I yeah. see, without necessarily the kind of soul-making kind of narrative. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. In her case, in the case of his patient, yeah, I don't necessarily see that thread. That's probably right. I think in other cases you you might, especially mm -hmm. I mean, especially in the context of therapy. Yeah. Bringing up what you did in past lives actually helps you moving forward. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering, Professor Jane, <laughs> some Jane. Yeah, the uh, Jaina perspective, sure. Mm. Uh, not, not, not only sensory, it can also be, there are different forms of perception. Yoga Japaratakshya is another kind of perception. Yeah, but I know it's not. <laughs> oh, yeah. How is Pratyaksha, direct perception, defined in Vedanta? Um, Vedanta is very broad, but I mean, in, in, in this particular, um, well, not just, I mean, Vedanta, Nyaya, there are other schools, and they, they define Pratyaksha very broadly as percep direct perception, which encompasses both sense perceptions, like seeing a wall, hearing a voice, and also Yogaja Pratyaksha, which is um, yogic perception of super sensuous realities. <clears throat> so both. And I think Jainism would agree, right? They accept Yogaja Pratyaksha and Nyaya. Yeah. It's Mimamsa who attacks Yoga Japataksha. Uh, they talk about that in chapter six. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm very interested in the part where you talk about the epistemic value of mystical testimony. Yeah. And I think it can be difficult to discern who is credible is credible yeah. or not. So yeah. in in the argument you put forth, and I'm sure you talk more about this later, like yeah. how do you recommend yeah. cultivating That's tricky. that discernment? In this world of fake news, mm -hmm. we don't know who, who to believe anymore. Um, but that's, yeah. Um, especially in the case of spiritual experience and, you know, life matters and so observe the person who's claiming to have these experiences if, if that person has really had a transformative spiritual experience they should be transformed and so they shouldn't behave like ordinary selfish people and, um, so if they don't pass that test you can presume that their testimony might not be true that's one example but there you know Swami Vikram used to say um the person who the, a person who has just had some kind of drug experience thinks that he's realized God or something and then comes comes back from the high. That person's the same Tom, Dick, or Harry or, you know, that he or she was before having that experience. But the person who goes into the state of samadhi, you know, the highest spiritual experience, and comes back, the person, even if he went into it as an ordinary person, comes back from the experience as a saint. Um, so to what extent does the experience transform the person? Of course, that also, it's hard to judge sometimes, but it's fallible. And these are all, all these things are fallible. I mean, and nobody denies that. But um, I think that's one criteria in itself. Mm -hmm. I keep forgetting to repeat the question, so I'm oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm, I probably was sorry. I, you're close <laughs> enough to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not a suit. This mm -hmm. is a big one. Um, first, thank you. Mm. It's a very you. worthwhile lecture. In fact, I'm so excited to come. Mm. I'm not blind. I got a hotel room tonight, so I can hear you. Oh, that's so uh, very generous of you. Thank you. <laughs> I see. No, I appreciate but it. We're all very interested in the souls, the eternal consciousness. Mm. And there are many imaginative constructs and paradigms for whether it's Dante, um, and I'm interested in how your presentation um, might be in dialogue with neuroscience mm. findings. Uh, right now, I see mm. some of my colleagues are doing research on syllabi. So I have not experienced activating mm. mushrooms, but people who have been resistant to antidepressants, mm. it opens a neuroplastic right. window and they have a different perspective and mm. insight. Mm. Um, Bison, we heard a uh, person who is running a big study in Brazil, and they have a church that's around um, mm. Ayahuasca mm -hmm. and it's a ritualized experience. Mm. 
um, there are psychiatrists who become shamans and guys, they no longer do pharmaceuticals, they only do natural mm. things. So the danger obviously is if this is a shortcut, mm. what about spiritual discipline for the fruits mm -hmm. that you're talking about for transforming your life mm -hmm. so that you have the capacity for something else mm -hmm. or yeah. for service. Um, so part of uh, my colleague's recent foray uh, is to do mindfulness, which is a different part of the brain mm -hmm. with the uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, um, in your studies, if you see that it's something one can exercise with meditation, mm -hmm. yeah. with concentration and attention, that it increases the capacity. Oh, certainly. So yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, she, the, the questioner was um, talking about how many people, through the use of the ingestion of psilocybin mushrooms, right, psychedelic mushrooms, um, found relief from various mental health issues. Um, uh, yeah, and it's true. And I went to Amsterdam a few weeks ago at Leiden University. There was a big conference on mystical experience yes. and entropy. So, I was part of that. And um, like 95% of them either themselves take right. those kinds of drugs. It's either ayahuasca or psilocybin or LSD um, or are involved in, they're like scientists uh, investigating other people taking these kinds of drugs and seeing the effects. And most of them find that um, the evidence is very positive. Um, uh, at the same time, Indian spiritual traditions in general um, caution the use of drugs as for the reason that you mentioned, which is, or I, I give another reason, which is related to what you're saying, which is that because you're when you're taking a drug, you're handing over your agency to that drug. Um, whereas the idea behind a life of sustained spiritual practice is that you're still the one in control and you're not surrendering your agency to some external substance, physical substance. Um, or you're willing to die to your ego, which is a part of your constitution. So that the free fall is in the spirit. So yeah, that's nice. Yeah. And so I mean the idea is, you know, that there are shortcuts in spiritual life, I guess. The drugs is one of them, but it's they're not advisable to take. And part of the reason is that it's better to because if you if you just take a drug and you're elevated in some kind of very ecstatic spiritual experience, you might not be ready for it. Yes. Mentally, morally, uh, spiritually, and it could it, it could have really kind of more disastrous uh, consequences as well. And I, I think one thing that hasn't really been done extensively is longitudinal studies on, on these things, uh -huh. more long-term kind of, it might be short-term that's really helping with mental health issues, but that 20 or 40 years down the line, there might be more serious issues. We have a question on Zoom. Oh, okay, how do I, okay, I'm gonna click on chat here, right? Oh, so should we, okay, let me, Ask unmute or what? What do I? How do I let her talk? How do I? Yeah, ask to unmute. Go for it. Should I do something or? Yeah, please. You can ask your question. Okay. Um, namaste. Namaste. So, um, <clears throat> my question is, um, okay. So once, just as an example of, you know, past life experience things. So I had been meditating about twenty years. Um, I went to um, a conference for the um, Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness. Mm. Um, I was a graduate student in anthropology at the time. And um, in the evening, we had this um, induction by the shaman who had us lie down in Shavasan. And um, once we he had us fully relaxed, his question was, when did you first exist? Mm. And... I just saw this black field and then there was like one, it was like a black card, one after another, flipping, 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 mm. flipping. This went on for quite a long time. And then finally I saw something and I was this single celled organism clinging to these plants, which seemed to be sort of purplish in color. And the sun was way further away than our sun is from our planet um, and it just lasted for a few seconds and then i was i was back in the room mm. now my question about things like this is okay um 
So the mind is the interpreter of experience. And as my guru used to say, um, you know, vikalpa can be true or false. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think about this and I think, wow, you know, entirely plausible. But then at the same time, I had an undergraduate degree in biology and then had studied evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I had this idea that, you know, life arises from single right. cells first. And so, you know, it's always a, an interesting thing um, mm -hmm. with these kinds of experiences. The question is, how much is added by our present attempts of our mind right to, to sure. make the experience, what we're experiencing um understandable in some way so, yeah no that's a great question yeah there's a whole um theory of mystical experience called constructivism which right. basically is along these lines the idea is that when i have a, a, a spiritual experience of something my own preconceptions my training my background my my concepts at least partly shape the nature of that spiritual experience. Um, and the sort of opposite paradigm to constructivism is what's often called perennialism or the common core theory of mystical experience, being the idea that there is one kind of, or very few types of spiritual experience that all people have, that all mystics have, but that they explain those mystical experiences in different ways afterward, retroactively, uh, because of their respective backgrounds. Um, and I've, chapter five of my book on Ramakrishna, Infinite Passing Through Reality, it's called Beyond Perennialism and Constructivism. And I defend a new paradigm, which I think is defended by Ramakrishna, which I call a, a manifestationist paradigm of mystical experience. And the idea is, so the, the, the strength of the perennialist paradigm is that it grants full reality and veridicality to spiritual experiences. And so it takes at face value the testimony of mystics across the world. But the, the big weakness, as people like Stephen Katz have pointed out, he's one of the biggest constructivists, is that it doesn't honor the diversity of mystical experiences. I mean, the Christian mystic like St. Teresa, who's hearing, like having divine locution, like she's hearing the voice of Christ, that can't be the same spiritual experience as Buddhist nirvana, or the Advaitic, you know, experience of Nibhikabha Samadhi. Phenomenologically, they have to be different, right? And so this is, Katz makes this point really um, strongly. So that's the weakness. And on the other hand, with constructivism, the strength is it's able to honor the diversity of spiritual experiences. You know, Katz is an expert in Jewish mysticism, so he talks about divikut, this Jewish kind of spiritual experience, which is very different from a Christian mystical experience, which is different from a Vaishnava one, and so on and so forth. The weakness is that constructivism has this kind of subjectivist implication. The idea is that um, my so-called spiritual experience is at least partly a mental construct. I mean, it's kind of not quite a hallucination, but Hick, for instance, has a very interesting phrase. This is an interpretation of religion. He calls it a veridical hallucination, which sounds like a paradox, but it's because it's partly constructed by the mind, but mystics, mo most mystics won't accept that explanation. You see, they're going to say, no, I know that it's fully real and I'm making contact with a reality and no amount of constructivist telling me otherwise is going to persuade me. Um, and so manifestationism, on my understanding and on my reconstruction of Ramakrishna's teachings is as follows. He says that there is a single infinite divine reality which manifests to different mystics in different forms and aspects, depending on... so that same divine reality will manifest as Christ to a Christian mystic, will manifest as Allah to an Islamic, or to a Sufi mystic or something, will manifest as Krishna to a Vaishnava and as Kali to a Shakta, but it's the same reality. And so it, it, it helps itself to the kind of philosophical advantage of perennialism because there's, it's positing a single ontological common core across all spiritual experiences. It's the same infinite divine reality in all cases that's being experienced, but, it also helps itself to the main advantage of constructivism, which is that phenomenologically, the Christian mystic's experience of that infinite God is very different from the Vaishnava's experience. And that's also very different from the Jaina's experience. You see that? Yeah. 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 In that symbolic symbol of the two, mm. where it says, the Christian name of God, where mm. it says, you know, mm. this Ishvara cannot be constrained because mm. each bread has no history mm. and yet we can 
approximate and become proximate with mm. that reality through the stilling of the mind. Mm. So, yeah, that's interesting. I'll just repeat it briefly. But uh, you you brought up the concept of Ishvara in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, and how Ishvara might play the kind of role that Ramakrishna's infinite divine reality plays in his manifestations. Part of that. That's really interesting. I mean, yesterday I was giving a class on um, Raj Yoga, Vivekananda's Raj Yoga, and I was talking briefly about Ishvara Pranidhana Va and how to interpret Ishvara in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. And I think that the only honest answer for a scholar to give is that it's complicated. Um, and I mentioned, for instance, that there's a whole range of views on the spectrum. And on one side, you have people like Gerald James Larson, who really downplay, the, uh, he says that Ishvara in Patanjali is not at all the theistic God in devotional traditions. At the other extreme, you get Edwin Bryant, for instance. Um, he's written a wonderful book on Patanjali, you know, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Um, and he's defending a more robustly theistic interpretation of Ishvara in Patanjali's system. And he also kind of marshals evidence from some of the traditional commentators on the Yoga Sutra. I think Vigyana Bhikshu and others. But I think it is complicated. Um, and I would I'm, before I, I wouldn't be comfortable taking a strong stand on it until I do more research on Ishvara and Patanjali. Thank you. Yeah. So for now, I Mm -hmm. has done a series of mm -hmm. and he defines them kind of as mediated immediacy mm -hmm. or mediated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so we all have these social images imaginaries mm -hmm. that come to bear mm -hmm. context yeah 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 yes. but that the experience of presence is something that unites us all we desire to be more present mm -hmm. and our Meditation, mm. um, and and to have the fruits of that. Mm. Mm. So, uh, would you want to comment about presence and the experience, the intimacy of that presence? Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So she was saying that Bernard McGinn, a professor at University of Chicago, is uh, he explains mystical experience as a kind of mediated immediacy or immediate intimacy? Is that the second? Yeah, mediated mediated intimacy. Um, and what do I think about that? I'm not sure. I'd have to look at his work more carefully to see exactly. I mean, it sounds kind of constructivist -y, um, but is, is it some, is it constructivism or is it something different or? No, mm. story on um, mm. Okay. Um, I, I mean, happy to share in his Yeah, no, history. please. Yeah, maybe after, yeah. I mean, without reading it, I, I don't want to say anything about <laughs> what, what he's actually saying. Yeah. So do you think consciousness changes within the spirit uh, It can evolve, but it's the same right. consciousness. I mean, uh -huh. it's a consciousness of one and the same soul. That would be the So how does presence work? Consciousness. Mm. Presence. Mm. Presence. What do you mean by that? How, how would you correlate being present to presence mm -hmm. to an energy source greater than yourself? Mm -hmm. So repeat that for the purpose. Okay, but I, I'm not even sure <laughs> I know what she's saying. <laughs> Could you rephrase that and maybe I could try to reproduce it? Yeah. So if her desire for mm -hmm. is aware and present in the moment mm -hmm. of each other's presence, of a presence that encompasses us, then how does increasing our capacity inform the success of life? Huh. Okay. Uh, if, as far as I understand your question, if the aim is to what expand our consciousness, is that the idea? Right, right. Yeah. So rebirth is one of the key kind of pieces of machinery in helping us to expand our consciousness. I think that's the way I would see it. Um, but it's the same. I mean, it's the same. I don't want to say this consciousness is static, but it's the same. Um, what's the way to put it? It's the same consciousness that can either expand or contract, and that's the idea uh -huh. across lives. Yes. Yeah, maybe that would be a better. Way. Is that a point of contact with the mind, just a perceptual? Well, I want to say that it is a, yes. making contact with reality, but constructivists of more of a skeptical stripe will deny that. What's the hermeneutic suspicion? Yeah, con constructivism is that. I mean, it, it's, it takes more of a skeptical take. But again, there, there's actually a range of views within constructivism. Some are 
explicitly religious, like Hicks. Others are agnostic, like Stephen Katz is, and others are atheistic, like Jure Christos and others. And so there's, it's not one view. It's, so it's better not to be monolithic even more constructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with your, it was manifestationism. Yeah. Uh, or Ronald Christians, yes, yeah. Can you explain a little more about the mediated individual experience and how that differs from constructivism in your in yeah. Ronald Christians' conception? Like you said, yeah. it's, it kind of takes the best parts from both. Like, yeah, although I that... yeah, I I think that I think one thing that's true about I think most mystical testimony is that they don't subscribe mystics don't subscribe to constructivism. They don't mm -hmm. say that my experience of God or the soul is conceptually mediated. They say we transcend all concepts. We, you know, yeah. This is a direct, palpable, spiritual experience. And I think Ramakrishna just fully accepts that. Mm -hmm. So he denies conceptual mediation in that sense. But at the same time, he's able to explain why there is so frequently a correlation between the kind of theological background of a given mystic and that mystic subsequent spiritual experiences. He says, lo and behold, the Christian mystic has an experience of God as Christ. And lo and behold, a Sufi mystic has an experience of God as Allah. And lo and behold, a Vaishnava mystic has an experience of God as Krishna. But it, he doesn't explain that correlation with the constructivist paradigm. Instead, he says, it's because the, inf the same infinite divine reality lovingly manifests in the particular form that the mystic okay. prefers. Okay. That's so it. there's intention. Yeah, okay. it, so it's from the side of God, the divine, yes. rather than from the side of the subject, you see. Thank you for saying Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, and the other thing that, another sort of uh, weakness that a number of philosophers have pointed out in the constructivist paradigm is that it has a hard time explaining surprising mystical experiences or novel mystical experiences, mm -hmm. right? So if, if, a, if, if there's a Christian mystic who suddenly has an experience of Advaitic Brahman, <laughs> how is the constructivist going to explain that if all of their training has been in the opposite direction? Right? But these things do happen. Sri Aurobindo, for instance, was not at all sympathetic to Advaita Vedanta. And he was learning meditation techniques from Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, a yogi in Baroda. This is in the early 1900s, 1908. And that Lele, the yogi also was not interested in Advaita Vedanta, was not teaching him Advaita Vedanta. But Aurobindo had the experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, and knowledge of non-dual pure consciousness, which he didn't want. <laughs> and he talks about it later. So, so constructivists have a hard time explaining that. Again, manifestationism. So Ramakrishna has this, he distinguishes two principles, okay? One is, or I call them principles. These are his teachings, and I reconstruct them in the principles. But one of them is God is bhakta vatsa, bhakta vatsha in Bengali, which means God is a lover of his or her devotees. So that's the one that explains yeah. the correlation thing, right? So God lovingly manifests uh, himself in the particular form that the mystic loves. But there's another principle. God is ichamani in Sanskrit, ichamani in Bengali, which means God is self-willed. So God can also choose to manifest him or herself, if you think of God as divine reality, to a mystic in a form that the mystic even may not want. If God feels that that'll be to the mystic's benefit in some way, either spiritually or to help mankind, for instance, and so on and so forth. Uh, can you, what's the yeah. experience that you're thinking well, Right. Without seeking it? Oh. No, uh, it's Trappist. Oh, yeah. Where he had the experience. And that was not an experience that he was seeking or kind of. No. Right. Okay. So that's interesting. Yeah. But then he went on to. Hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So just repeat Thomas Merton. So, <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Thomas Merton had a, an interesting experience of cosmic consciousness and Advaitic kind of universal love experience in, in Knoxville, Kentucky. Louisville, Louisville Kentucky, which uh, he was not seeking, which again is a, another piece of counter evidence against the constructive spirit. So we are about 16 minutes over time. So oh. thank you. For All right. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, oh. Yeah, you There's that thank you so much. Okay. And, and thanks. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.
So thank you all. If you're not on our mailing list, find your way to our mailing list. And we have many more events planned for the months ahead and hope you all stay connected with us. So namaste and have a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.